living fiction. Northwestern University, in cooperation with the National Broadcasting Company, brings you a radio dramatization of another timeless story. Today, James Fenimore Cooper's sea adventure, The Pilot, another in a series of living fiction. It is soon after the events of the American Revolution have involved the kingdoms of France and Spain and the Republic of Holland in our quarrel. Round a point of land that forms one of the sides of a little bay on the northeastern coast of England, an American frigate and schooner ease their way to a point of anchor amid the sandbars and sunken rocks with which the coast abounds. From the schooner, a small boat conveys its commander to the side of the frigate and when he climbs to her deck, is greeted by the young first officer of the heavily armed vessel. Well, Captain Barnstable, in answering our hail to come aboard the frigate, you are prompt as usual. Tell me, Mr. Griffith, what kind of a game is this we're playing? Is the old man mad? Does he think the bottom of the schooner area on his frigate are made of iron, and that a rock can't knock a hole in them? Or does he think the crafts we sail are manned with alligators who can't be <laughs> drowned? Uh, Captain Munson ably commands this frigate, Barnstable. He knows your prudence too well to fear either the wreck of your vessel or the drowning of her crew. But why sail we to this treacherous position? I thought our mission was to go ashore at a more admissible point and abduct a few prominent followers of the throne that we could use them in exchange for American prisoners. Well, that is our mission. And this, our first important step toward its accomplishment. Before our goal may be pursued further, we must pick up our pilot. Ah, uh, yes, our pilot. The mysterious gentleman signals from ashore and we race in answer to his call. Perhaps into the very muzzle of shore batteries. Well, we fly the enemy ensign from our feet. No circumstance could demand that to be a command of mine. Well, it is well to resemble a hornet when flitting about a hornet's nest, Barnstable. Bah! This is droll navigation indeed. First we run into this unfrequented bay that's full of rocks and sand pits, and then we get off our pilot. You get off our pilot. I? With the assistance of the lad, Mr. Mary, and the harpoon carrying Long Tom Coffin. You're to go with them in the whale boat to the beach. And how am I to know this pilot? Well, he's a small man who'll be garbed in a drab pea jacket. When you find him, you're to ask what water we have in this bay. If in his reply he speaks the word confidence, he is our pilot. Oh, it is a child's game I am to play, Griffin. A game of cat and mouse. Well, then play it well, Barnstable, lest he be the mouse. Long Tom Coffin! Mr. Barry! Make ready the whale boat! Aye, aye, sir! I suppose that is your way of telling me to be on my way, Mr. Griffith? It is. There's not much daylight left, and from the looks of the sky, this bids fair to be a night when a man needs a spyglass to find the moon. If you meet with difficulties ashore, show three oar blades in a row. Three oars on end and a pistol will bring the fire of my muskets, and will draw a shot from the frigate. Hmm, on our own heads, no doubt. A long shot makes a great smoke and some noise, Mr. Griffith. But it's a terrible uncertain matter of throwing old iron about. Well, then let's hope its tossing will be unnecessary. Whaleboat ready, Mr. Griffith. Whaleboat ready, Captain Barnes. I heard. Going out of the beach. Be prompt, be cautious, and above all, be successful. For the sake of our mission, Barnstable, bring back our pilot. <laughs> Beach, he called this shore on which we landed. Hear me, Mr. Mary. Hear me, Long Tom. Beach, Mr. Griffith, called this perpendicular mountain of rock and sand and brush. A bad place to be for a retreat, this clearing, should we happen to fall in with the enemies. It is that indeed, Mr. Coffin. Where are we to find this pilot, sir? The answer to that is little known to me as to you, Mr. Mary. And so, the answer to the question of whether or not the unknown man will betray us. The pilot has the confidence of Captain Munson. Has he now, Mr. Mary? What a pleasant thing for the pilot. Look, someone comes this way, and he is small. Well, I should hardly call that wrapping of his a pea jacket. Stand you here, men, while I go and hail him. Oh, a question, please. What water have we in this bay? The usual kind, sir. Wet. What's this? 
How would you like it, stranger, to be brought aboard my ship a prisoner that I may fully enjoy the benefit of your wit? <laughs> Hear ye, stranger, you're merry out of season. I'll not be laughed at by a stripling who has not the strength to carry a beard if he had one. Barnstable, dear Barnstable, how adorable you are when angry. Do my ears deceive me or... Turn here to the light. Catherine. Catherine Plowden. The very same Catherine Plowden you last saw in Carolina. Only twelve long, long months older. Catherine. I knew you were somewhere in England. And, and I... well, you should, for it was you who drove us here, my cousin Cecilia and I, you and Edward Griffith. It was the dread of becoming uncles to those whom he calls rebels and traitors that prompted Colonel Howard to flee from Carolina with his nieces. And the other loyal subject of the throne, young Christopher Dillon. And that other loyal subject of the throne, young Christopher Dillon. We are all at St. Ruth's Abbey. So close to here? How amazing this is, Catherine. Of all the places in England where orders may have directed me, I came to this tiny bit of its shores in search of our pilot. And I find you. It is I who found you, Barnstable. And might have not been the only eyes to sight the frigate in the aerial. The false banners that flowed from your peaks did not fool me, nor will they fool all. Your danger is great. But well worth the running for this precious moment. More precious are the moments at some time hence. When Cecilia and I are rescued from the loneliness of St. Ruth, we don't... Barnstable? Hold, Catherine. A stroller walks this way. A short man in a drab pea jacket. I say, my good man, what water have we in this bay? Enough to take all out in safety who have entered in confidence. Ah, there by the hedge are two of my crew. They will take you to the whaleboat, and I'll join you in a moment or two. I, I believe I can prevail on another hand to go with us. Time matters more now than any number of hands, and the consequences of delay must be visited on those who occasion it. I will meet the consequences with those who have a right to inquire into my conduct, sir. My men await you. Is that your pilot, Barnstable? My pilot, Catherine, or a king. His manner makes it difficult to determine. Is he to report to John Paul Jones? John Paul Jones? Oh, what idiocy is this? I have heard word ashore that John Paul Jones may be aboard one of the crafts that anchors below. Then the word you heard is nonsense. It is of no matter. What is, is that with our hearts overseas, Cecilia and I are little less than prisoners at St. Ruth. We don't you like You said it. a moment or two, Captain, or an hour or two. Ha, huh, he is a king, and no doubt. You had best go. No. Ah, yes, Barnstable, because I ask it. Go now, but come for us soon. You will find us willing captives, Cecilia and I, if Griffith and yourself are our conquerors. Catherine. And you'll never believe what occurred on that shore, Griffith. I saw this person walking toward me. Captain Barnstable, return to the schooner Ariel and get in the way immediately. And just who is to justify to Captain Munson my moving without orders? I have already justified it. I require more than the word of a stranger to recognize the word as command. You'll get underway immediately, Captain. A nor'easter blues, as any man who's been to sea can tell. Two hours hence, a heavy swell will break where the these vessels now ride so quietly. True, true, sir. But if I'm drowned here, I'm drowned according to orders. I am giving the orders. Make sail! Keep your anchor down and you'll follow it to the bottom. The aerial sails upon the word from Captain Munson only. Then go aboard her, Captain, and make sail. Captain Munson. You'll respect the pilot's word as my own, Barnstable. Get the aerial underway and stay within hail of us. Aye, sir. A small boat from the aerial awaits you. Come. I'll see you on your way. Now then, Mr. Griffith. Beware, pilot. Now you trifle with us ignorantly. It's a dangerous experiment to play at hazard with an enemy. You know not what you threaten... Nor whom, Mr. Griffith. I know not what I threaten, Mr. Pilot. As for whom, that shall be determined as you discharge your duty. All canvas is furled but the three topsails, Mr. Pilot, and we appear to hold our course well. Yet I would give five years from my life I know we'll be short if the ship lay one mile further seaward. About here we are getting to the true tide and real danger. We must hold a shallow channel or run aground, Captain Munson. 
Order the lead line out, Mr. Griffith, and get me the right water. Keep away that lead, Mr. Coffin. And call a good depth, Long Tom. Eight or ten. By the mark of seven. Seven. Tis well enough. But now is the time to watch her closely. I got Long Tom. Keep away that lead. Observe, Mr. Griffith, how our pilot will guide us to safety. I will observe our pilot closely, Captain Munson. And a half five! Five and a half feet, she shows! If the next to the lower call, give the order to attack immediately, Mr. Griffith. Use the speaking trumpet that you may be heard. And a half four! Helm the lower! Hey! Riker! Riker, set ahead! If she responds to her helm, we'll clear. Riker, set ahead! We must be in the bite of shoals. She won't respond now. But lose her way. This is the situation. We'll be scraping bottom in a moment. An anchor might hold her, Mr. Griffith. An anchor might, Captain Munson. Bear away the bow anchor. No, give me that trumpet. Hold on, you men. Stay to your station. Who is it that dares countermand my orders? Is it not enough that you run the ship into danger? You must interfere to keep her there? He is our pilot, Mr. Griffith. Then all is lost indeed. And among all the rest, the foolish hopes with which I visited this coast. Hold fast the helm! Swing up the head years against the wind! Mr. Coffin, heave your lead as we swing about and give me the right water! Hold fast the helm there! I say, fast! By the mark! She shows, Mr. Pilot! Helm to windward now! Hard! Luff, fellow, luff! You're broadside to the sea! Now, you seamen, give her both jib and mainsail. All that canvas in such a tempest? By the mark! Oh. She shows, Mr. Pilot, and there's naught you can do about it. Steady on the helm. She'll soon feel the shock of the wind on her green canvas. Hold her helm. Look there. It's the jib blown from the belt ropes. Did I not say it was perilous to loosen all that canvas? The anchor, Mr. Pilot, it's our only chance. Mr. Coffin, are you sleeping? Let me hear you! By the mark! Oh. The anchor! The anchor! Where are the yards? In Mainsail! Ah, the frigate lies her proud bones in a hard bed this night. Steady your course now! Hold fast the hull! And a half mark. A deeper call. She may be swinging to the channel. She is, Captain Munson, and to the sea beyond. What think you the next call from Long Tom, Mr. Griffith? And a half five, or perhaps only four. Should be nearer the call. You do best to add the two together. By the mark, ten. The trumpet wit, Mr. Griffith. We are in safety now. By the mark, fifty. Silence, Mr. Coffin. You've established the worth of our pilot. The deeper you call now, only the deeper my chagrin. <laughs> Highlight thickens, Captain Barnstable. As does the plot, Mr. Griffith. When we touch the enemy shore, we go off on the way to fulfill the major part of our mission. The obtaining of several individuals of character from the enemy. At the meeting aboard the Ariel a while ago, the pilot leaned kindly to your suggestion that we two be assigned the task of capturing Colonel Howard and his unworthy associate, Christopher Dillon. And why not? They make likely prey, do they not? Both are loyal subjects of the throne. Tell me... How did you know that they were at St. Ruth's Abbey? Catherine Plowden told me. What, Catherine? I had no opportunity to tell you before, but I saw Catherine. Where did you see her? When? Last evening, atop that cliff you called a beach, where you put me ashore to go in search of the pilot. Truthfully, Barnesville, you saw her? Uh, well, was she alone? You mean with Cecilia with her, I suppose. No, she wasn't with her. But she is now, no doubt, close by, for both are sheltered by the roof of St. Ruth's. Hold those oars, men. Oh, I lived in hopes that some lucky chance might throw Cecilia my way. You term a mission which leads into the den of the lion a lucky chance? Oh, what strange observations are prompted by love. We touch the enemy shore, Barnstable. Then let's be on our way, Griffith. And pray we may touch the friendly deck of the area once more this night. What are 
you doing at the window, Mr. Dillon? I told you, Colonel Howard. I thought I heard some sort of commotion outside. Nonsense. I heard none, and Catherine heard none. Did you hear any, Captain Burrowcliff? I heard none, Colonel. You hear, Mr. Dillon? Sit down. You make me nervous, and unnecessarily. The captain has the abbey well guarded against any attack by my rebellious and misguided countrymen. But if that was a commotion I heard... It wasn't, I'm sure, Mr. Dillon. Your nerves are on edge. Your own are not what they should be, my dear Catherine, judging by the way you tug at that handkerchief. Cecilia, my dear, how beautiful you look. Here, sit here by me. I'll be quite comfortable here by my cousin, Catherine, Mr. Dillon. <clears throat> yes, yes, of course. You really yes. should sit by Mr. Dillon, Cecilia. Or better still, by the military might of Captain Burcliffe. Little good I could do to protect you from the ruffians who caused the commotion Mr. Dillon thinks he heard. Catherine, did that? I mean... Yes, what do you mean, Cecilia? I, I mean that... Well, well. Yes, orderly. I have been instructed to advise you, sir, that our sentinels are detaining two suspicious-looking men who by their dress appear to be seamen. Oh, no. Shh. Ha, silly talk, was it, Colonel Howard? Nonsense, eh? Did I say I heard a commotion outside, or did I not? You said it, Mr. Dillon, in quite enough times. Orderly, have we nothing better to do than stop foot passengers on the King's Highway? Let the men pass. I beg your honor's pardon, but these men seemed lurking about the grounds for no good, and Downing thought it best to detain them. Downing is a fool. Downing is at least alert, Colonel. Then he's an alert fool. Where are the men? Outside this door, sir. Downing thought they might Downing be... thinks too much. Send the men in here. Very good, sir. I I beg to be excused, Downing. Now, I? now, Cecilia, there's no need for you to become unduly alarmed. These men won't harm. Perhaps Cecilia begs to be excused for another reason, Colonel Howard. Perhaps these ah, men... Are... here they are. You understand, of course, gentlemen, self-preservation requires of us that you be detained, but only to clear yourselves of any doubt on our part, which I'm sure you'll have no trouble doing. I am not of that opinion, Colonel. Did I ask if you were, Mr. Dillon? Seaman, you look to be, gentlemen. So I'll ask a question or two in your own nautical phrases. From whence came ye, pray, and... Whither are you bound? From Sunderland last, and bound overland to Whitehaven. That voice. Where have I heard that voice? Carolina, perhaps? He, he sounds just like Henry Fletcher. Yes, yes, doesn't he, Cecilia? No, Catherine. No, Cecilia. You both know very well who he sounds like, don't you? No doubt, because he is. Eh, Mr. Griffith? Griffith? Are you mad, Mr. Dillon? This unkept, unshaven, slovingly-looking man... Forgive me, sir... You take him to be Edward Griffith, and who be the other? Regardless of whom they may be, Colonel Howard, I demand their further detention. You demand? That justice will be done, and enemies be treated as such. But we have no proof they are enemies. I think it proper that the men be detained. Ah, Captain Burrowcliffe adds his wise word to mine. As to proof that they are enemies, Colonel, just wait. Where are you going, Mr. Dillon? That you climb into your wraps and spurs. I ride to attend to some important business, Colonel Howard... And if what I believe is true, it will be some very important business indeed. Hurry, Cecilia, hurry. If I hurry more, Catherine... The breeze will blow the flame from the candle. How wretched my dear Barnstable looked in that disguise. And your Edward... Shh. There's the door to the cell. Oh, I trust the orderly won't suspect we have not given this key to Captain Burrowcliff. And that he truly believes his commanding officer requested it. Ah, there. Griffith? Cecilia? Is that you? Oh, my darling... After all these lonesome months since Caroline... Where's my Barnstable? Catherine. Ah, there he is. The gallant gentleman who calls to release me from within these walls and instead becomes entrapped within them himself. Listen! Oh, that Mr. Christopher Dillon, tending to his important business. He was certain of my identity. A new ship of ours must be near at hand. He departed from the Abbey some hours ago, was to locate the vessel and have it fired upon by shore batteries. I think, Mr. Griffith, you hear the guns of the Cutter Alacrity. Cutter! Mr. Dillon ordered it to this vicinity at the first report of American vessels sailing off our shore. Griffith, we've got to get aboard the aerial and give our boys a hand. Well, getting aboard is no simple matter, Barnstable. 
Or is the more immediate task of escaping from here? The door at the end of this corridor is unlocked, Griffith, and a thick hedge outside will conceal you from nearby sentinels and permit your escape. I think not, Miss Plowden. <gasps> oh, Captain no. Barrowcliff. In His Majesty's service, Mr. Griffith. I think it best we adjoin to the upper chamber. When Mr. Dillon returns from his duty well done, he will perhaps want to ask each of you a question or two before condemning you to a scaffold. Yes, Mr. Dillon, you were right. This gentleman is the rebel Griffith. And the traitor Bonstable, as I also suspected. And both in disguise, Mr. Dillon. I suppose you scoundrels know what this means, Griffith. This being war in which we are engaged. We are well aware, Captain Berkeley. Tell again the story of how the alacrity saw to her task, Mr. Dillon. Repeat in detail how the aerial now comes to lie at the bottom of the sea. I enjoy watching the expressions of anguish which comes to the face of our doomed prisoners. <laughs> and I, Captain. Well, to begin with... No, you don't, Mr. Griffith. Don't move another inch toward that door. I would dismiss the thought of escape from the Abbey if I were you. This little whistle in my hand, if circumstances should prompt me to use it, I think you should find a sufficient number of my men behind these doors and about these grounds to detain you. Hm. Do I make myself clear, gentlemen? Now then, Mr. Dillon, do you wish to continue the tale of the Alacrity's victory and the Ariel's defeat, or shall we busy ourselves with making arrangements for the hanging of these two? Other arrangements have been made, sir. Yield yourself to the power of the 13 Republic. It's our pilot! Ha! And who is this man you call pilot? A Samson that his single arm can change the face of things so suddenly? Down with your own weapons, masquerader, or at the report of this pistol, your body shall be made a target for another 20 bullets. And thine for a hundred, Captain. Without there, and or let this confident gentleman feel his weakness. The crew of our frigate! By what authority, sir, is it that you dare thus to invade the castle while a subject of this realm? Do you come back by the commission of the Lord Lieutenant of this country? I bear no commission from any quarter, but rank only a humble follower of the Friends of America. Having permitted Mr. Griffith and Captain Barnstable to enter into danger, I thought it my duty to see them extricated. Mr. Dillon, did you not tell us that after the Ariel went down, the victorious alacrity guarded these shores? She did that, Captain... Right up to the moment our men boarded her and relieved her of that duty. We, we've we lost the alacrity. And we the aerial. So I think at time now we brought the unhappy tidings of this day to a quick close. The dwellers of St. Ruth will be escorted aboard the frigate immediately. And our bow will be turned toward friendlier shore. <laughs> It is a long way we sail for home, Mr. Griffith. The rising sun shows our bow pointed to the Holland coast. We drop our pilot there and then head for home, Barnstable. Oh? Are we to lose the man who came from nowhere to assume such high command among us? And how disappointed is he in the smallness of the success of our mission? The pilot was encouraged rather than disappointed by the results of our mission. Encouraged? In that it has taught so many of us, himself included. That even a just goal is not easily attained, and a failure to achieve it only makes so much more worth striving for. Strange vessel off the port stern! Ah, another obstacle in the path. Look there, Mr. Griffith. She's an enemy, and no doubt. A tall ship and within a mile of us. Coming on like a racehorse in the breeze that befriends her. Uh, let the racehorse beware he does not stumble over the cannon shot with which our men await the word to greet him. Well, he's eager for the prey. He cannot wait to hail within striking distance to let loose his fire. Are the ladies secure below? They are. That's the way to talk to these rebels. Colonel Howard, I'm afraid, sir, you will soon find this deck unpleasant and dangerous. You know little of old George Howard, young man. If you think he would for thousands miss seeing that symbol of rebellion which flies above, level before the flag of his majesty. That's telling the rebels, speak again and put these traitors in their place. His Majesty speaks with a loud mouth, Mr. Griffith. Is it not time to answer back? I think it is, Barnstable. It is not, Mr. Griffith. Well, here is that strange pilot of yours who seems to hold the authority of a John Paul Jones. Certainly far more than most pilots I've run into. Enjoy it, sir. Enjoy your authority, for you'll not have it much longer. Get below deck, Colonel Howard. It is my pleasure, pilot, to remain and inhale the odor of loyalty that is wafted from yonder floating Tower of the King. <laughs> 
now, hear him curse you rebels and traitors to the throne. If it be your pleasure to remain on deck, Colonel, we will respect your pleasure. Mr. Griffith, give the order to fire. Now, lad, let them have it. See what happens to you rebels. Submit to the clemency of the crown and yield to the royal mercy. Let our sails to close in, Mr. Griffith. Good, Mr. Pilot, close in. Drop yourself down the throne of the raging lion. Let fall. Open your boom. Hoist the way of everything. We'll be broadside to them in a moment, Mr. Griffith. And a scatter of grapes should unreave their rigging. Unreave their rigging, you say? Huh? Go again, Mr. Pilot. Closer. 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 Perish, rebels. Perish, traitors. Answer to the severe judgment of his majesty. Colonel Howard. Colonel Howard is down. To your duty, Mr. Griffith. Give them some break, lads. Bring them fair and drive them 50 yards. Be close in, lads, to take We rest off the Holland coast, Mr. Pilot. Very good, Mr. Griffith. The claws of that enemy lion were sharp and true before we trimmed him for him. But more damage he did to his own cause than ours. For his own blow fell a very strong friend in Colonel Howard, and his mere presence brought about the loss of another. Uh, Christopher Dillon was a fool to attempt escape by swimming to the enemy vessel under that terrible crossfire. Whaleboat ready, Mr. Griffith. There's a time for parting, sir. I extend my hand to a faithful pilot and a great... A very great seaman. I accept your hand most graciously, Mr. Griffith. At times we did not see eye to eye, but how little you may have realized it, though we traveled different roads, we headed toward the same destination. I truly regret this separation demanded by duty, but you will be quite content, I am sure, in the company of another, one more charming and personable than I. Farewell, sir. Oh, Cecilia, my darling, and Catherine. Does our pilot depart with no word of farewell? When duty calls, Catherine, there is little time for social niceties. What an utterly strange man he is, Edward. I have never known anyone quite like him. Nor I, Cecilia. He's a man of consummate knowledge of his profession. A man of cool, deliberate, and even desperate courage. But, but who is he? I cannot recall that I ever once heard his name called. He's a just man, Cecilia. Just the man who is ready to lay down his life for a cause in which he believes. There he goes, answering his call to duty. Will the pilot report now to John Paul Jones? No, Catherine. It isn't necessary for the pilot to report to John Paul Jones. In fact, it isn't possible. The Pilot by James Fenimore Cooper is another in a series of living fiction. Presented each week by Northwestern University in cooperation with the National Broadcasting Company. The pilot was adapted for radio by Bob Maley. The cast and directors were students of Northwestern University. Mr. Griffith was played by Lowell Perry. Captain Barnstable by Don Staples. And Catherine Plowden by Pauline Pierce. The pilot was played by Jack Lanning. Others in the cast were Rush Evans, Tom Longman, Don Niff, Mitzi Rock, Claire Nelson, Lincoln Bumba, Bert Weil, and Gordon Croy. The director was Earl Bark. The assistant director was Joseph Gillip. The entire production was under the supervision of John Cowan, and this is Dick Noble. This 
is the NBC Radio Network.